cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. Lord, we thank you that we can build our lives on your love. May we know that love greater today. Amen. Please take a seat. Kia ora, everybody, and welcome to Shul Vineyard this morning for church. My name is Julianne, and if you don't recognize me, that's because I usually hang out at our evening service. But at the moment, instead of our evening service, because it's so good to be back together again, we have changed things up a bit. But I'll get to that in a moment. So first of all, welcome to all of you. I'm so glad you could make it back to church. It is so good to be here after we've been apart for so long with lockdowns and everything. And a special welcome if this is the first time you've been to Shaw Vineyard. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And whether that's because you're just passing through, wanted to check us out, or are hoping to find a new church home, we are so glad for whatever reason that you can be with us here today to worship God. So if it is your first time, um, I have some chocolate for you, or maybe a lovely person has already given you some. But if you haven't gotten our welcome chocolate, which also has a little bit of information about who we are, what we do, um, then come see me in the break, which is just going to be coming up. The next thing is, so what is this plan for October? Why am I here in the morning? The reason is that we have decided to turn the evening service into rugby. So that happened, that happened last week, and apparently it was great. And it's happening again this afternoon, rugby and dinner. So rugby at 4, 6 p.m. dinner, and it's Rupert's Fried Chicken. And so if, if you haven't heard about Rupert's Fried Chicken, um, you need to come along because it is legendary. And then what we're doing next week, um, because we really just want to focus on being together and connecting again after so much time apart, is we are, there's no rugby to watch, unfortunately, um, but there is going to be, uh, we're going to have a worship night. So you can come along to that. It's a worship and pray night, and it's going to be wonderful. Alrighty. So we have a children's program and a program called Seek for um, uh, early high schoolers for our youth. So now it is time for you to go and have a lot of fun. So over there, is Rupert in the red hat is for um, Seek, early high schoolers, and Matt, who's also over there, is taking the kids out. So you can all head on your way. And just while that transition's happening, I will let you know a little bit about, a little bit of housekeeping that we have just around parking. So um, obviously there's a lot of car parks around the building, but we just do have a couple of requests of where you do park or don't park. So um, the the, our neighbours, who are the shops above us, um, request that if we pretty please don't park in front of them so that their customers can come in and out, otherwise we clog that up. And similarly, we've had it a couple of um, instances where we really just want to keep the mobility parkings free for people who have a mobility pass so that they can park and access church um, because it's a lot harder if they have to park away. So ideally, um, the best places to park are on the road or also we have special permission to park for our church services at the back of the gym, which is next door. So um, what you can do is you can park down there. Those are the best places so that it leaves the back of church um, available for families with little kids who just it's much easier to be closer to church um, or, um, or people who need a bit more of a uh, mobility access. So that's just a quick note on parking. Uh, next up is giving. If you would like to become a giver, if you would like to contribute to making this whole church thing happen, we would uh, love for you to be part of that um, so that we can keep the lights on, pay the wonderful people who work here. And um, so you can give by internet banking, the code's up there, or there's an EGPOS machine at the back which you can um, give a donation by or you can put check into the green box. 
thoughts on the doors you exit and if you need a hand with the egg puff machine just um let me know i can give you a hand Alrighty, i'm just gonna get my list out and check i've got everything Alrighty, now is the really fun part of the service, which is, we, we're calling it today, um, chocolate and chatting. So, what we wanted to get you to all do is stand up. Yes, thank you. And a couple of us are going to come around with chocolate, and this is the point where you can munch something, but turn to the person next to you, behind you, walk across the room, catch up with someone you haven't seen in a long time or a new face, and soon Vic will be back with us with the message. Kia Tefano. What a, it's so great to be back together and you can just converse like this. The old Facebook Live doesn't quite have the same, uh, doesn't quite have the same atmosphere, I guess. But we're going to get straight back into our last couple of songs of worship here. So if you are still standing, don't sit down, don't sit down. If you've sat down, <laughs> get back up, get back up. <laughs> awesome stuff. have passed away, but your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains our cornerstone. The things that we thought were dead are breathing in life. we love you oh how we love you you are the one now our hearts adore the hopeless have found their hope the orphans now have a
ocean poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, we love. To hear Kite Fenua, to hear Kite Gako, Onga Tangata Katua, to hear Kite Rangi. There is but one love, and it is your love. Ko te mea nui, ko te aroha, to But one 
get a word that comes to me. I think these days, uh, well, quite recently, everyone's talking about the new normal, whether it's through work or just the rest of your life with how the world is at the moment. Everyone talks about the new normal. And I think for me, it's, it's been quite an important thing to remember that whether it's the old normal or the new normal, Jesus is our constant. That in the new normal, there's the old and the faithful and the loving of Jesus. So this next part that we're going to sing, that your love has freed us. free indeed, that you speak to our pain, and you reveal hope again. And that's constant, that's always, that's forever, always revealing hope, always speaking to our pain. has freed us we're free indeed spoken to our pain revealing hope again your love has freed us we're free indeed spoken to our pain revealing hope again sing it out your love your love has freed us we're free So we celebrate our freedom, Lord. We celebrate your nearness. We celebrate each other's nearness. Lord, we pray for, maybe for ourselves, maybe for those who are beside us, maybe for those who, who we know of who might be struggling in some of those areas. We ask that your grace would be with them. Your incredible love would be drawing near, even right now. Lord, we pray within our, within our building here today for each and every need, each and every uh, desire, and each and every pain maybe. Lord, as we collectively and individually just lift them to you, Lord, we, Lord, we trust you with them. We offer them to you. And somehow we want to go away changed, 
whether the situation's changed or whether we've just changed inside. And we offer this. So it's just almost a holy moment, isn't it, where you can reach out and just almost so personally and intimately say sorry say please say thank you So, Lord, sustained and nurtured by being invited into your presence and being with each other. We say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, that was a beautiful moment, it feels. Hello, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you, Andre and team, Anne, Ruth, and Tim. Thank you for leading us in worship. My name is Vic Francis. It's my great pleasure to pastor at Shaw Vineyard, and uh, wow, it's so good to see you. It does feel still like a novelty, even though we did church last week. It's still, uh, you're still not quite sure until about two days beforehand that's actually going to happen, just in case something does happen, uh, aren't you? Um, there have been at least a couple of epic things that have happened within our church community, and we may see if there are any more, but um, we um, celebrated a little last week by photo, but um, Phil Harris is here, and of course Phil and Jamie uh, had baby Zachary just the week before last. So just congratulations. We showed your photo. We were pretty awed by it last time, but it's so nice to see you back at Soundfest. Yeah, it's like, wow, what a guy. That's incredible. So congratulations. Yeah, I think that's, that is so great. Please pass on our love to the family. And then Jamie and Ian got engaged last night, just like you do sometimes. So this is Jamie and Ian down here. And we're... Absolutely pumped for that. They're getting married sort of early next year-ish, and so isn't that a wonderful thing when you can sort of be part of and to celebrate, you know, people finding each other in that way. Um, and then I thought, well, because I haven't been in touch with all of you and stuff like that, has anyone else had anything epic happen in the last week or so? doesn't quite need to compare with that, but is there any anything we should know? Anything anybody wants to tell us? We sometimes do the joys and concerns. Not quite such that, but is anyone bursting with news? No? Just pretty ordinary life overall. Pretty ordinary COVID year, really. <laughs> sort of no new normals around here, Andre. It's just like, wow, it's just, wow, that's the way it is. Well, I'm going to speak out of that anyway, so I think it should be kind of fun. So let's, um, let's pray. Let's invite God to be with us and to speak to us this morning. And so, God, we thank you for whatever is the journey that's got us to be sitting on these seats today, whether it's been an epic journey, whether it has indeed, whether we are indeed in the new normal, um, or whether we've, we've kind of just trucked through in some way, right? We are really aware of the fact that these, this will be a year that we'll, we will look back on many years to come. And so we each have a journey, we each have a story, and Lord, we each have a place that we arrive at today. And Lord, we just present ourselves. We, we would love to hear your voice. We would love to hear you speak. We would love for you to draw close. And Lord, we do that with you, in Jesus' name, amen. So we are out of lockdown, aren't we? Man, that's, um, that's a pretty awesome thing to do. Uh, we've survived, or we've thrived, or somewhere in between those things, I suspect. We have a new government as well, or a, a new version of the old government. And for some, that might be the best news, and for some, that might not be great news. It's at least there's at least one Labour voter. Um, but I suspect there's probably more than one Labour voter here, seeing they, were, they won so many. So for some, that'll be good, maybe some not. We are, to use a, a phrase that we've got used to in unprecedented times, unprecedented. Don't, did, didn't you enjoy that when it first came out, and didn't you get sick of it when we used it so often, so often, so often? But unprecedented, I suspect it is. And I've thought a bit about, you know, so where's Jesus in unprecedented times? I want to explore that a little today. 
Um, if nothing else, I guess we've learned during this year how life uh, is unpredictable, and I, I, I suppose we knew that already. I think pastors next year, when they get up in their first service in January and when they boldly proclaim this is what we're going to do as a church this year, will probably be a little more circumspect than they were at the beginning of this year. Except for me, because we did this message on community and community was going to be important. I feel like we hit the jackpot with that because community is important whether you can meet or not. But nevertheless, isn't it incredible how things totally unforeseeable can happen in your lives and we have to somehow be able to negotiate those things and figure out where faith is and life is and indeed where Jesus is in the unprecedented. You know, so if in, even just in church times, if you'd said to me at the start of the year, you know, come the end of the first 10 months of the year, you will have not met more often than you will have met, I would have said, well, what would we look like at the end of that? I don't know if we could survive that, and yet we seem to have survived and, and, and maybe, you know, kind of even done quite well out of the process. And I know that would be an individual thing and all of that, but it's a really significant thing, and, and each of us in our own ways will be experiencing something of that. So what I want to do today is I want to read you one of my favorite passages, um, and then I want to begin to sort of explore what this might mean for us with Jesus in unprecedented times. I think it'll hang together, and I'm quite looking forward to bringing it to you. So the passage is from Luke chapter 5. I would love you to turn there if you've got Bibles, but I'll, I'll actually read it all to you and have it on the screen. Um, but it's kind of just helpful to go through. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 5, and I think it'll be a familiar story to many of you. Um, and then we'll kind of grow into it as we go. So one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. That was sort of the first thing that attracted me to this as I was looking at it this week. About, I, I felt a little challenge in there about the crowding around and actually listening to the things that Jesus was saying. And that's why I highlighted that a little bit in, in this. You know, kind of what, a, what an invitation that seems to be. Um, and it goes on, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, and this is a little part of the scripture that's been in my heart for about the last five years. He said, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. To me, that's, it's, it's become so much more than a little historical record of something that Jesus said and did you know, kind of there on Gennesaret. But it's been an invitation of God, I think, to put out into deep, whatever that means, and let down my nets, maybe again for a catch, and we'll see this as the story goes by. So I'm not just sharing a little bit of my own personal journey, but we can work with the scriptures these ways. Um, it's not just telling a story, it's speaking to us today. Going on, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Oh, because you say so, because I've lent them, because I've heard your voice, I'm going to let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. I love this sort of sense as, you know, kind of, it is so big that I need to work with you. And they filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. What a fantastic story. And what a wonderful story to read in the context of, you know, kind of where we are today, rather than just looking into the history. We have these new phrases, don't we? Andre mentioned the new normal phrase. Um, we have this unprecedented times thing, which have come into, into perhaps our, our um, sort of vocabulary in ways that we may not have been aware of in the past. And so I've been thinking a lot about the sense out of these scriptures, what does it mean to be, you know, Jesus when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, when we don't know, you know, th there will be church next week unless we're locked down, you know, kind of, we never thought about that before this. We could always say, you know, can, unless, you know, something apocalyptic happens or Jesus returns or something like that, there will be church next week. Of course it is, it's as sure as night follows day. But there will be a job next week unless we lose our job because of the process. You know, we've all faced and maybe are still facing some of those things. And so Jesus in the new normal, Jesus in these uh, unprecedented times. And within the vineyard, we have this idea of wanting to walk a radical middle. 
So we often talk, you know, kind of we, we want to walk in the middle of sort of, you know, kind of great theology and great practice, and there are various ways that we look at it. But we are, we are practiced or we are aware of this idea of taking tension and work, walking within the middle of that. And sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't necessarily do it so well. But I, I want to create a bit of tension between conflicting maybe or maybe complementary ideas this morning so that we can just be thinking through what this thing is Jesus being in the unprecedented. And I want to take it out of the scripture that we've done. And so the first tension I want to draw is the tension between being together and being alone. Being together and being alone, I think, is something that we've been aware of a little bit over the last little while. So Jesus is with everyone, eh, sort of in the story. He's, you know, kind of there's a lot of stuff that's happening around. There's a lot of people who are around. And yet Jesus is with Peter, definitely with Peter. And I think you kind of argue he's probably with others individually too as they're observing, as they're taking, as they're picking up from their own life. And so there's this thing of together and there's this thing of alone. And we've, dis- we've discovered some of the joys of being together that we've missed or, or the joys of coming back together and some of the joys of being alone that we you know, kind of might not have experienced before but have had their advantages but also had their disadvantages. So this very public event is taking place. It's like a church service is ta- taking place around the shores of Gennesaret. And there's all these people here, and yet Vic's there, and he's important, and Ruth's here, and she's important, you know, and Anne's here, and she's important, you know, and Chris is here, and she's important. Steve's here, and he's important. And so we do this thing together, and we're working in the way that we're figuring it out as we go along the way. We love, we've discovered, I think, while we've been apart, being together. And so when we did our online services and, um, you know, kind of we worked really hard on that. I think we did a really good job with our online services. But from a peak at the beginning when it was a novelty, um, if we were doing grass, which we don't really do, but the numbers began to dwindle away. And, I mean, you will know that because probably you watch more of our online services at the beginning than at the end because it's not quite the same doing church alone. You know, we discovered and we found. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's better than not being able to do anything, but being together, there's something magic. And then we did Green Church, and we put the thing out, and you could almost feel us, I don't know if it's in my imagination, but you could feel us as a congregation lift when we put out on social media, we're getting together in the park two Sundays ago. And we did those five Green Churches, and and it was like people were responding on social media, and they're looking forward to it, and the people who were leading it were kind of being creative in the way that they did it, and we gathered together for those things. And it was like, well, this is what we want to do. Together is really important. I think we had something of that feel last Sunday, our first Sunday back as well. Together, we discovered, is important. Together is important because we pull in nets, both empty and full. Sometimes we pull in the nets, we're just disappointed. And sometimes we pull them in and it's like they're breaking, but it's something that we to do together. That's together is a really important thing. Together, we share the good times and the not-so-good times. Together, we create culture. We we um, find out what it means to love one another. We, 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 we work on solutions to problems as they arrive. We have, oh, yes, we have our family differences from time to time. You know, there are times where it's actually hard to be together. It's annoying to be together. But we do that like good families do, and then we go forward because we are family. It's what we're creating. It's what we are together is good. But we also have to do it alone. And we might have discovered that a little bit within the COVID lockdown, because in the midst of a crowd, um, or because of circumstances where we find ourselves, we, we, we have to find the way that we're doing this journey, this faith, this, this relationship with Jesus for ourselves. Because it might just get taken away. Our meeting might get taken away. And, and you know, the, the steadiness of the worship team, which we know will have prepared, or the, the person who's preaching or something like that. And so we discover that we actually have to, to be working on this thing alone and that Jesus wants to meet us face to face and we're not nameless and faceless and, and just a crowd to Jesus, but we're important and we're known and we're named. And this is an important thing for us to be figuring out and working on. And we need to be able to respond. And so we've worked a little bit at least on putting resources into hands. You know, kind of we've given you a, a liturgy, for example, with communion, which maybe you might kind of think, why are we doing this thing over and over again? But somewhere deep within we've implanted something that, you know, kind of we could say the table of God is now to be made ready. And it's like, oh, yes, I, I, can, I can connect with that. And we've, we've, we've done resources that we've been able to put out, both for adults and children, with the idea that we could 
I guess, self-feed or that we could, we could um, kind of grow and be to, to, to be people who are, who are furthering what it is to be in relationship with Jesus along the way. And I think there's the invitation for both of those things. We sometimes talk about being an, um, you know, living for an audience of one. And so for an audience of one, we're beginning to develop and grow, and it's important that we do those things. So, so, so if we have future lockdowns, then we have the opportunity of saying, okay, well, we're locked down and I can't meet on Sunday, but we'll probably have something on the, you know, kind of on the website or on the TV or something like that. But I can. I can live this life. I can be Peter with Jesus along the way. So together is important and alone is important. The second sort of pairing, you know, that I've had in mind over this time is um, the, 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 the thought of movement and stillness. And, and during the early part of this week, I said, I'm going to do a message on movement. Movement was my big word, and then it sort of got tempered as these things do over a little time. But movement was really important to me this week. The sense that God is a mo- God creates movement in our lives, and that, and that a lot of the things that are changing us and growing us come in relation to movement. In this um, story, we have um, frenetic activity, you know, kind of the, the nets are empty, the nets are full. You know, there's fatigue, there's busyness, there's probably the heat of the day, there's the sense of disappointment, there's, you know, the expectation because Jesus is around. And so you have this frenetic activity and you have this moment where, where Peter falls at the knees of Jesus. I was actually going to do that for a minute, but I'm not sure that I get up again. So, <laughs> no, I won't do that. And so you have this sense of movement happening, kind of if you were to depict it in sort of a water thing, you'd sort of, you know, you've got the, you've got the calm of the pond, but the but the movement of ripples, and you know that, you know, as beautiful as the calm is, there's also a sense that creating movement's important as well. Biblical movement in a generic sense seems important. You know the story of Ezekiel 47 where they talk about, um, you know, kind of uh, entering into the, into the river, to the, to, the, to the ankles, to the knees, to the waist, to the, and, until your feet can't touch the ground. It sort of seems to be a movement. Sort of Moses going to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. So he leads them on a journey into the desert and eventually to the promised land. Well, Jesus setting his face like flint towards Jerusalem is a journey that I'm going to take, and it's through to, to complete the purposes of God. Or um, the road to Emmaus, where I was just walking along and the stranger came up, and it turned out that I had this revelation of Jesus. It seems like movement is a really important and significant thing. And it seems like sometimes it's not how close you are to Jesus, but it's the direction that you're traveling. And I guess I've been, I've been really challenged over recent times by the story of the prodigal son. I, I am a natural older brother, you know, kind of, a, I'm, I'm not really a prodigal, you know, kind of in terms of going away and wasting the family inheritance and, you know, kind of, I'm a, I'm a better boy than that. But I have great tendency to be a, to be a um, sort of, I, I guess, religious older brother. And, and something that I felt like God spoke to me at one stage is, that the younger brother, the prodigal, when he turns and heads back towards the father, is much further physically away from the father than the older brother, and yet he's much closer in terms of heart to the father than the older brother is at that point. And I feel really challenged about that. We had something that happened in church, um, which was quite a surprise to me about a year or so ago. We have a communion one Sunday. And, um, and, you know, so we had communion and, you know, kind of as we do and as we do often. And afterwards, I was talking to this young exchange student who came and visited. He probably was with a family um, that's here, I don't know. And he was a Muslim from Saudi Arabia, I think it was. And I'm just chatting to him about church, and he's saying, um, and I'm saying, oh, well, have you, have you been, ever been to a church before? He says, no, you know, kind of, a, you know, I could go to a mosque, but I've never been to a church. I said, how do you find it? He said, Oh, he said it was just wonderful. And uh, I mean, his English wasn't fantastic, but, but the essence of what he's saying, it was just wonderful. There was a peace there. And, and, and he starts to talk about the, the time that we all got up and we walked and we, we, we have the bread and, and the juice. And I'm thinking, I have a theology that says you shouldn't be doing that. And if, I'd asked, if you'd asked me, I might well have said, man, I, I'd just let the Christians do that, you know, kind of thing, sort of a Christian thing. Do. And yet he's there talking about a journey and a movement at which he encountered and met Jesus. And I'm thinking about it and thinking about, for me, that, you know, kind of communion was sort of, it might have been a throwaway line on that Sunday. 
but here he's encountering in a sense Jesus so it's the movement and the direction is a really important thing that's taking place there and so I think it's an important thing for us to be considering along the way is, is, is are we moving or are we stuck you know and if we're stuck then God's invitation is for us to move I think and yet as much as movement is important I think stillness is important as well a calming of our inner self is important and something that Jesus will introduce us to with. When you take the, the body of work of books and writings and stuff that have come out of the history of the church and the ones that have lasted, there are some great movement books, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, Protestant Reformation books or missionary journeys, missionary stories books, all of those fantastic. And they come through the ages and they still inspire us today. But I think, well, I'm sure it would be fair to say the ones that have really lasted and stayed within the wider church as being profound are the ones that talk about an inner, if we can use the word movement, into stillness and silence and solitude and to a relationship with Jesus that is growing and is not dependent on the doings that we so often are involved in. So when I did my master's, I've shared this before, but the, the book I hated the most was a book um, by a 16th century um, Catholic nun called Teresa of Avila um, called The Interior Castle, which she talks about this journey of seven stages into your heart, essentially, where Jesus already exists and um, of meeting him there. And it's like, it's just, I was going to say it's tearing my hair out, it's just, just driving me bananas, this book. It's like, can we just do something instead of have this process? And yet, ten years later, it's still the book that I quote the most and that I'm most aware of because there is an invitation of God for us to meet him and know him and just to just to let the air out of our lungs and stay there and be with him and not have to do anything. And we do move, don't we? And we do stuff and we make plans and all of those things. But at some place we have to find a journey within that leads to a stillness of heart that is that is untroubled by what's happening in other parts or on top of the waters or you know, for whatever metaphor that we want to use. And so we, we have this tension. It's not saying, you know, we should all just stop whatever we're doing. But but it's not an either or, it's a both and, or I, I think so anyway. And so movement and stillness um, take us from master to lord, from independence to dependence, from distance to intimacy, from following self to following Jesus. Wasn't it amazing when Peter fell to his knees and, and what did he say? You know, kind of go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. It, it, when we come close to Jesus, it, it reveals ourselves, who we are. This was his deep water moment. You know, kind of, he, it wasn't catching fish. That was, that was, that's a story. That's a great story. But his deep water moment was meeting Jesus, not fishing. And so how important that is. And then finally, um, and I've struggled a little bit for these words, um, and so hopefully I'll be able to explain in a way that's helpful. I think there's a sense of tension or growing between what I'm going to call diligence and spontaneity. And so, you know, you had the, um, the scripture that says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And so, you know, the fishermen, having been exhausted and frustrated, no doubt, and maybe their subsistence in a sense, you know, they haven't even got food to feed their family, who knows, but they respond to Jesus' invitation. And this, there is the sense that we have I think of, of, of a lot of what we do is, is a form of discipline, is a form of, you know, kind of we do it because it's the right thing to do. You know, you might have heard of the spiritual disciplines, which again come out of the history of the church, which is an inner movement. But the sense of they're called disciplines because, because actually they require a discipline to be part of, you know, kind of be it the, you know, various forms of prayer or intercession or fasting or serving or, you know, the various things that are that we would sort of loosely group as the spiritual disciplines. Or, or, or um, mending relationships or making sure relationships uh, are in good heart. You know, I, I had two conversations this week, which in a sense a lot was riding on because if the conversations went poorly or either of the people in those conversations weren't committed to, them, to each other at the end of the day, it could have caused a fracture. And in both cases, both people in that conversation were committed to that process. But that takes a bit of diligence along the way to be able to do those things. It's like, I'm not going to break up with you. I'm not going to, you know, kind of let this thing 
be a permanent, you know, kind of impediment in what we do. And so that's the easier thing, is just to say, say whatever I darn well want to say and, and move on. But we do these things out of a sense of, you know, who and what God is. And so the diligent thing is, I think, really important. But there's also a sense, isn't there, of the spontaneity of the invitation of Jesus just kind of dropping in and saying, you know, kind of, it's a fantastic thing that you're doing. Now, come and do this with me. The, the different ideas of the things that we can do and, the, and out of the sort of the, the, the regularity of what we do being open to the sweet invitation of Jesus to, to, to come into a, a new depth, a new understanding of who and what we are. And so I love um, Thomas Keating's idea of 10,000 distractions are 10,000 new invitations to return to God. I mean, how good is that? It's like, you know, kind of, so you might be here and you might be completely distracted. You might have turned off church the last time we were here and not watched any of our, um, you know, kind of online services or, either, or opened your Bible or sung a worship song and you found yourself here. And it's like, you know, there's a, you'd probably almost feel guilty if that was the case. And yet, in another sense, there's this, the invitation of God that the distractions are actually an invitation to come back and reconnect or connect with God in a new way. 10,000 distractions are 10,000 invitations to return to God. And I think that's something that Jesus would offer us today. And so we invite Jesus into our unprecedented, into our lives so that be it routine or be it normal or be it new normal, we are able to walk forward in the things that God is, is working with us in our lives. And so as we come to a, a, an end, what I want to ask you to do is I, I want to ask you to stand. And I'm just going to invite the presence of God to be in some of these uh, tension things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of call you out, not, not personally or by name or anything like that, but I'm going to invite you personally to um, present these things before God. So I'll just kind of lead you through, and we'll just take a few moments to do this, and then we'll close, and then we can move on. So God, just let your presence be here today. Jesus, come into our unprecedented, come into our new normal. So, Lord, we just we bring our togetherness before you and our aloneness. And I think, you know, as we pray, just sort of just think about those things. You know, kind of, do you feel connected? Do you feel together? Is this a good thing, what God doing, you know, in a more corporate way? Or, and or, you know, and what about aloneness? You know, kind of, is that okay? Is that something that you're working with and able to work with? connect God in ways that we haven't? How could we contribute our five cents? And Lord, how can we do alone just really well that's growing and changing? And Lord, we bring before you our, our movement and our stillness. And again, it's like, you know, are you a, mo a, a mover or a still person, right? And maybe God might introduce you and invite you towards the opposite even, you know, to create that tension of the radical middle. So Lord, we think about the things that you're leading us to, the things we're inspired about and excited about. And Lord, if you say, you know, kind of drop your net over, Lord, we, we're excited about that. But Lord, if you invite us to be at our knees at your feet, meeting you and knowing you, seeing you um, face to face, we thank you for that. we bring before you our diligence and our spontaneity. We, maybe we bring before you our older brother nature or our younger brother nature. It might stop.
God's word for something in us. And Lord, we, we want to be people who do good and do the right thing. But we also want to be people who can hear your voice in our invitation. And we thank you for these things. So just as the worship team is going to come, we're going to just close with two of you today. Let's just, just allow God very present to be inspired by the things that he does and the things that he says and the wonderful opportunity we have of being together today Lord we thank you for that in Jesus name so we're not going to do an evening service we normally meet at five we'll be starting that on the first Sunday in November likely we're coming through that early and but tonight, we've got test four, great turnout last week, so do come, do be part of it. And then Rupert's chicken, which we're really looking forward to as well. So God bless you, Shaw Vineyard, and um, thank you, Andre. To hear to hear kite fenua to hear kite ngako ponga tangata katoa to hear kite rangi to hear Kite fenua, to hear kite ngako, ponga tangata katoa. There is but one love, and it is your love. Kote to our pain revealing hope again your love has freed us we're free indeed spoken to our pain revealing hope again your love your love has freed us we're free indeed spoken to our pain
God bless you. Have a fantastic Sunday afternoon and we hope to see you at 4.30.